really good. So we're gonna talk about community cat program managers. This is part one. So many paws, so few hands. Um, and we have um, Brian Cordes, who is the co-founder and national programs director for Neighborhood Cats, a leading community cat advocacy group with hands-on programs in New York City, New Jersey, and Maui. Currently, he and his wife, Susie Richmond, executive director at Neighborhood Cats, live in Hawaii, where they have helped transform the state from high kill to community cat friendly. In between stints with Neighborhood Cats, he served as a grants manager for PetSmart Charities, overseeing over $21 million in TNR and um, spay-neuter projects. He has produced many of the leading educational materials on trap, neuter, return, um, communities, in, including, sorry, including co-authoring the Return to Field Handbook published by HSUS, assisted numerous communities in setting up large-scale TNR programs and co-designed with Tomahawk Live Trap, many of the most popular TNR traps now on the market. Brian can currently be found uh, teaching monthly TNR basic training workshops and advanced webinars with the Community Cats podcast. And Brian is going to be presenting as well as helping to facilitate a uh, panel conversation today. With him um, during this event, we have um, Angeline Fahey. She is um, the Community Cats program manager for the Maine Society of Southern Arizona, whose program provides trapping assistance, guidance, and education for several counties in Southern Arizona on trap new to return and colony management. Angeline also coordinates a group of community cat trappers, advocates, and rescuers called the Southern Arizona Community Cat Coalition, whose members work together to reduce and eventually eliminate the number of cats born outside uh, through the process of trap new to return, compassionate community education, and foster placement of unsocialized kittens. Angeline has always had a passionate for nonprofit and volunteer service, having earned multiple community awards for her efforts and compassion to help others. We also have Sarah Hollers. Sarah is the manager of the community cat department at the Animal Care and Control Air Animal Care Centers of New York City. She's worked as the lone employee in the department for several years, developing ways to utilize staff and resources in other departments. This helped make the community cat department a key player in reducing the overall shelter population and ensuring appropriate placement and care for community cats coming into the shelter system. By making community cats part of the shelter culture from day one, improving the flow of communication with clients and the public, and building stronger relationships with the community both in and out of the shelter, Sarah has been able to increase her agency's ability to safely care for and provide resources for community cats in New York City and has even gained a staff member in the process. Sarah originally hails from Southeastern Oregon, completing her undergraduate degrees at the University of Washington and the University of Oregon, earning her master's degree in painting at Hunter College. Sarah taught art for several years. After learning about TNR and starting projects in her neighborhood, it wasn't long before TNR and community cats became the clear focus in her work efforts. Helping community cats by helping the people who care for them became a reality for Sarah at the city shelter. And then we also have Jane Sage. Jane has dedicated two decades of her life and counting to the community cats and communities of the city of Albuquerque, uh, Bernalillo County and surrounding areas. This makes her uniquely qualified to provide insight, assistance, and, and most importantly, knowledge relevant to the issues community cats face in a compassionate yet realistic manner. From 2013 to 2015, Jane served as the Community Cat Program Manager for Best Friends Partnership with the City of Albuquerque. In 2015, this partnership, this partnership led her to create the nonprofit now known as Street Cat Hub, where she served as Executive Director until 2020. The focus of this nonprofit is to continue both TNR in the Albuquerque area and return to field program in the Albuquerque shelter. This is, she is currently the board president and a volunteer trapper. Since its inception in 2012, this one-of-a-kind hybrid program has provided 4,000 to 6,000 spay and neuter surgeries per year, the majority for TNR, and now continues that much-needed pace in its own clinic, which opened in 2021. Today, Street Cat Hub has contracts with the city of Albuquerque, Bernalillo County, and the town of Bernalillo, and fundraises to provide support for independent trappers in rural, otherwise unfunded areas. As a pioneer of the Return to Field program, Jane has been returning shelter cats since 2011, 
The RTF program is the top tier of a three-tier program addressing overpopulation of free roaming cats in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Street Cat Hub works with trappers to manage smaller colonies, providing the second tier of assistance. And the third tier and the foundation are our trapping teams, which address entire blocks and neighborhoods and weaves together all three tiers. So this is an incredible group of people and I'm so thrilled and thankful that they're here today and able to join us. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Brian. Hey, thank you much, so much, Stacy, and thank you for, I think, you know, uh, hosting the first community cat program manager uh, training ever, you know, and, and focus on this. And um, it's exciting because this is a new and growing field and we have three people from, um, you know, with a lot of experience in this who are going to be on our panel. And before we get to that part of it, um, I want to give a brief history of community TNR and, and how we've arrived at the day when um, we have professionals and working in the field. And, um, you know, how did we get there? Because that has a lot to do with the challenges that we face today. So after I give this this brief presentation, probably um, 15, 20 minutes, we're going to hear from each one of our panelists um, about their programs, and then we'll uh, go into a panel discussion. So during the during the panel discussion, if you have questions, put them in the question box, and um, Stacy's going to be watching out for them. And um, when we get to uh, points in the discussion. Uh, where we we can address your questions, we're we're going to do that. Okay, so first let's start with where did community TNR? When I talk about community TNR, what I mean is looking at TNR programs from a global perspective, from from the community's perspective. So so um, not uh, not one colony, not one part of town, not one group but all of New York City or all of Tucson or all of Albuquerque. And we're looking at programs that um, reach everywhere and try to solve overpopulation on that scale. So let's, let's get started. So important to understand um, in the very beginning in the United States, the um, TNR was introduced on a large scale only only in the early 1990s. So we're talking, you know, like 30 years ago um, was when it first came to be um, presented on an organized uh, level, and that was by the group Alley Cat Allies. And at that time, and they're the first ones who really kind of took the idea of TNR um, uh, to a national level and brought it into the field. Before then, there were um, TNR programs, uh, small scale ones. There was one in Martha's Vineyard. I know there were individuals who were doing it. Um, a funny story is that I, I had a an artist studio in South Boston in the early 1980s, and there were a bunch of um, feral kittens in a warehouse where I was, where my studio was. And I wanted to rescue them, and I called somebody up looking for help, and she said, "Well, I can't rescue them, but um, especially since they were feral, I didn't even know what the word feral meant then. But she said I can spay and neuter them, and I just thought that was the most ridiculous idea in the world. <laughs> so, you know, it goes to show you um, there, there's always visionaries out there, but on a large scale, and and I wasn't one of them, <laughs> but. Um, on a large scale, it really was Alley Cat Allies that, that brought this in. Now, when they introduced Trap Neuter Return to the United States, there was immediately opposition from all the major interest groups that were involved. Um, so we're talking about animal shelters, um, animal control agencies, public health agencies, and wildlife, the wildlife conservationists all thought that TNR um, was just a horrible idea and we'll explore that just a little bit more like well, why, why did they think that so animal shelters and and you know we're going back to the 1990s and this this held true through the early to mid 2000s and they regarded tnr as actually 
anti their mission. They're, they saw their mission as providing care for cats, um, but care for cats did not include um, managing outdoor cats. It meant, uh, you know, bringing them into shelters and finding them homes and um, putting cats back outside, even in a a managed colony situation where there was a caretaker and they were fed regularly and they were unadoptable anyway, that was considered a form of abandonment. And um, it was considered more humane uh, to euthanize the cats. That, that was the mainstream thinking in shelters at that time. So, um, uh, you know, shelter, shelters were highly opposed and that was obviously a big interest group that um, people doing TNR had to contend with. So animal control, similar similar reasoning, um, they deemed, in, in addition to thinking that um, it was inhumane to be, you know, that was the standard then, it was inhumane to be practicing TNR. And, and, and there were lots of threats of prosecutions of abandonment for people doing TNR. None of them ever actually came to fruition largely because it's hard to argue that cats who are being uh, sheltered and fed regularly are abandoned but that was that was a constant um, threat that that um, animal control agencies uh, were holding over people which is if you do this we're going to you know have the DA charge you they also considered stray cats to be a nuisance uh, and uh, they're mission back then often enshrined in state law like in new jersey at that time was to pick up stray cats and not to have stray cats and also in addition the practice of tnr uh, violated a number of local ordinances not the ordinances didn't say you can't practice tnr but they might have things like you um you can't feed an animal outdoors or all the cats have to be licensed or um, there might be leash laws that cats were not allowed to roam and um, if you fed cats regularly like in Baltimore at the time if you fed a cat for three or four days in a row you were considered the owner of the cat so you then were responsible for licensing and rabies shops and anti-leash laws and and everything else under the book now public health they viewed cats outdoors as uh, basically rabies transmitters. That that was really, and, and there's still a lot of that in the public health field where stray cats are considered a, a zoonotic threat, um, meaning that they transmit uh, diseases to humans. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, uh, it, it's a legitimate concern in areas where cats are interacting with wildlife like raccoons um, who are in have rabies uh, is endemic in their populations so it, a, a cat could uh, catch rabies from a raccoon and then potentially expose people to that and the problem wasn't that a lot of people caught rabies from cats and then um, got sick and died from it the problem was that uh, as soon as a cat was identified as rabid and people had been exposed, they would have to be treated prophylactically with uh, a series of rabies shots. And um, at that time, I'm not sure what the cost is now, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was $3,000 per person. So there was one county in New Jersey where uh, somebody found a litter of kittens, brought the kittens to a veterinarian, the veterinarian took care of them, um, adopted all of them out, and then that turned out they all had rabies and died and 30 people had been exposed and the county was out $90,000. So public health was, you know, uh, back then really not very happy about TNR because they saw that as perpetuating the presence of cats in the community. And just so nobody's worried, this this guy was caught uh, that you're seeing in this slide, he, he was a raccoon that was caught in um, Manhattan actually when we were trying to catch a cat on a scaffolding and we caught him instead. So we just carried him over to the local park and let him go. So conservationists, uh, you know, the wildlife people, they were against uh, cats being outdoors because of uh, their potential for predating on native wildlife, especially 
any species that were rare, threatened, or endangered. And they, um, uh, cats could also be uh, competitors for food sources. So there are some types of birds, for example, uh, types of cranes that eat mice. And if there were cats in the area and the cats were eating the mice, then um, the, the cats were considered a threat to them. So you, you have all these major interest groups, the shelters, the animal control, public health, and wildlife conservation all uh, hating, basically hating TNR because they didn't want cats to be outside at all and they saw TNR as um, keeping them there. So because of this, all this mainstream opposition, trap neuter return really developed as a kind of anti-establishment movement. Uh, it was, um, it, it became, you know, it grew like wildfire. Um, it, it became a very strong grassroots movement where there were lots of individuals um, who were faced with outdoor cats and watching them reproduce and, and not wanting harm to come to them, but not wanting uh, exploding populations that uh, took to it and practiced it. But um, naturally, of course, they came into conflict with a lot of municipal officials and local shelters who thought what they were doing was uh, criminal. And remember, we're only talking about 20, 25 years ago. So it was practiced uh, by individuals and small groups acting on their own outside the mainstream of animal welfare. And it also, as you can imagine, became a kind of not only a um, anti-establishment, but you know, anti-authority and um, very decentralized. And the, 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 the movement, you know, really, if you had to label its motto at that time, it was just do it. Don't worry about the local ordinance. Don't worry about the shelter's opposition. Don't worry about the threats of prosecution. Just get the cats fixed. So, you know, naturally, uh, I mean, that was a successful approach to introducing trap new to return to this country, but obviously has its limitations. And um, because there's only only so far the movement could grow if it remained outside the mainstream of animal welfare. And when neighborhood cats came along, um, in the late 1990s, and we were looking at, uh, we were based in New York City and still are, and you know we're looking at potentially you know, hundreds of thousands of cats in the municipality. Uh, there was no way that and, and individuals without uh, mainstream services like spay neuter clinics and uh, funding and um, the law on our side, there's no way that we were going to able be able to make a significant dent in other than anecdotal situations. So it became part of Neighborhood Cat's mission to to bring TNR in, out, in, in from the cold and have it accepted by um, the, the you know mainstream establishment animal welfare. Uh, agencies and then try to bring all those resources in. So one of the ways that we accomplished that was we began offering training workshops, which were the predecessor of the online certification workshops on the Community Cats podcast today. And because we were in New York City and the ASPCA was is headquartered there, we approached them about working together. And the way we started working together was they allowed us to use their facilities to host these training workshops. And that slide is actually the ASPCA's boardroom at that time. And it had like all, everything high tech. It was really, you know, quite, quite a treat for us um, to come in and be in a, a comfortable high tech uh, setting where we could just teach TNR. And what you're seeing there is one of the very first um, TNR workshops that were were offered anywhere. So that, um, as the ASPCA became comfortable with us, and as a result of partnering with us, got to learn more about trap near to return and what it involved, they became more proactive. And um, you can see one of their mobile clinics here in the slide, and they began offering these mobile clinics uh, for free for for community cats, which 
uh, we called feral cats at the time. Um, so they would take their van out to whatever neighborhood and we would have you know, 25, 30, 40 cats in a garage and they would uh, fix them all in a day. So that was a huge advance. Um, they uh, adapted their policy position to be pro TNR. So that was a national, a national significance. Um, they had, at the time they had a, a ASPCA watch, I think was the name of it. It was a national magazine. And they did a feature article about TNR with lots of uh, photos that were taken by our staff. And then they began distributing our handbook on a national level at all, uh, uh, all over. So that um, having the ASPC, the force of the ASPCA all of a sudden behind this, you know, naturally started to push change. Another huge um, advance was when the Humane Society of the United States went pro TNR. And that happened in 2006. And it's an interesting story that I can tell now without getting into trouble, well, I hope without getting into trouble, which is the way that this came about was um, they had a new executive director at the time. His name was Wayne, Wayne Pacelli. And um, we thought that new leadership, it, it, before this change, they were all over the map when it came to trap new to return, and mostly their people were against it. They were they were considered very conservative, very uh, establishment shelter, and they um, really didn't like it. And their position statement, um, you know, it had it, it turned TNR into about seven or eight letters long, so it was acceptable, but it you know had to test and adopt and you know euthanize the positives, and it, it could only be an enclosed backyard in a temperate climate you know, uh, two miles from a road. Uh, so it was really no help at all. So we approached uh, Wayne Pacelli and, and, and asked for a meeting with him so we could pitch what we were doing and, and try to get their support for Trap New to return. And then we got a call one day um, from his uh, staff saying, well, Wayne is, you know, it was during uh, one of the annual conferences for the Humane Society of the United States down in Atlanta. And uh, we got a call saying, well, Wayne is, uh, are you at the conference? Because Wayne has about an hour tomorrow afternoon. And we were like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, we're there. Um, well, you know, thanks for giving us the time. And then we immediately rushed to buy plane tickets <laughs> so we could fly down there and make this meeting. And we had the meeting, and he was extremely receptive. And that began the process of that led to the change in their policy statement um, that you're seeing here. So once the United the Humane Society of the United States embraced it, then they began producing educational materials that that we helped to write and FAQs, and we did a um, a tour of uh, different communities presenting workshops about trap new to return, and it really um, again that started to spur a lot of change. Another huge event um, was uh, occurred in August of 2008 for Community TNR, and that's when the first known return, there probably were other ones, but this was the first one that was really known and the largest um, return, RTF, Return to Field Program. It launched in Jacksonville, and it was called Feral Freedom. And what happened was um, the head of First Coast No More Homeless Pets, which is a high volume spay neuter clinic in that area, um, Rick Descharm, he asked the head of the local um, shelter, municipal shelter, if they would return ear tipped cats because uh, that was something I, we at Neighborhood Cats had pushed as a way to start to work with shelters is ask them to let you have the ear tipped cats because that you know, kind of some way signifies ownership. So, um, he asked, and then um, the agency then turned around and offered to return all the feral cats, not just the ones that were ear tipped. So that became quite a challenge, and um, uh, Rick and First Coast No More Homeless Pets took it up. They got a grant from Best Friends Animal Society. Uh, they would pick up the cats from the. They would pick up the cats every day from the shelter, bring them over to the spay neuter clinic, get them fixed, drive them home the next day, and let them go. And boom, RTF was born. Now, this slide shows you the results of the first several years of that program. And the red bar is euthanasia. And in the year, the full year before the program began, you can see euthanasia was well over 11,000 cats a year. And then fast forward to 2014, and we're talking like 
um, 500 cats. So the the impact on uh, euthanasia and then the uh, kind of the side effect of TNR being more widely known and accepted. So you have this dramatic decline in euthanasia, and then you have a um, a, a steady decline in intake as well. So this sent uh, RTF off and uh, you know its growth. That running return to field programs, of course, led to the need for people to run the return to field programs. And that was one of the um, origins of the community cat program managers. So more developments in community TNR um, from starting in two th uh, from about 2009 or 10 through 2015, PetSmart charities started giving out grants for targeted TNR projects, meaning um, the project had to uh, aim to fix uh, a high percentage of the community cats in a given geographic area. So that concept first uh, came in and the grants included funding for personnel because you can't run these kind of large scale programs without dedicated personnel. These grants produced a growing body of evidence that targeting could dramatically reduce intake into shelters. So. Um, and then in 2014, PetSmart Charities published a book that I authored, um, and you see it here. It's one of your handouts, so um, you, you know feel free to download that. And um, that talked all about return to field and targeting and uh, mobilizing the, the public and kind of raised the idea of TNR um, operating on a large community scale and not just individually. In 2019, the Humane, tonight, the Humane Society of the United States published the Return to Field Handbook. And if you click on that link, it will take you to a page uh, where you can download that at uh, no cost. So all these materials help to spur the growth of community TNR. And um, in 2012, uh, Best Friends and PetSmart Charities partnered with several shelters on the three-year grants that combined return to field and targeted TNR programs. And we're going to talk a lot more about that tomorrow when we look at the policies of that community cat program managers are advancing. And the result of these programs, which not only did return to field, but also um, did you know, strategic track to return was um, dramatic drops in intake and euthanasia at these shelters. And in this slide, you actually see one of our presenters, Jane Sage, who participated in one of the very first um, community cat programs. And here she is um, loading a cat into the community cat uh, van to be um, returned to field. So um, through all this, uh, Community-wide TNR gained uh, a lot more acceptance, as, as you would expect. Um, shelters warmed up to it because the, the goal for shelters um, evolved from, you know, keeping cats off the streets and thinking that euthanasia was uh, more humane than um, if they couldn't be placed into a, home, you know, a traditional home. And the goal began to be lower intake and lower euthanasia. And so community TNR fit right into that. And as shelters redefined their mission vis-a-vis -vis feral cats, again, they needed staff to, to carry these programs out or they needed partners. Um, animal control has evolved uh, tremendously. Um, the National Animal Control Association is now endorsing uh, trap new to return training through the community cats podcast. Um, you have animal uh, control officers who who do TNR themselves or who promote services in the community to people with problematic, um, you know, feral and stray cat situations. Um, public health has has also uh, largely come around, and they've come to realize that. Um, it's better for a cat living outdoors to have one rabies shot than not to have any. And also all three of these interest groups kind of realized that you can't just make the community cat population disappear. That um, just not one, not wanting them to be there is not a successful approach. And euthani trying to euthanize all of them uh, had failed in, in the decades before the introduction of trap new to return. So just from a very pragmatic point of view, so that they could accomplish their objectives, 
they began to embrace trap neuter return. The only interest group that is still opposed are the wildlife conservationists. They're still stuck in, we wish they weren't there. Um, uh, but because that, again, is not a very helpful approach to say they shouldn't be there, you actually have to do something about it. Um, their, their, and their opposition has, has greatly weakened. Um, they can put up a good fight in specific local areas, but when we look at a national scale, they, they've clearly lost their fight to, to stop trap near to return from being the dominant approach to um, community cats. So there's now um, a number, when we look at um, animal uh, community TNR programs and community cat program managers, there's, there's a variety of them out there. And we have, um, these three are all represented on our panel today. We have um, uh, some shelters that only do return to field. Um, they're usually open admission shelters. Um, we have uh, usually what are private limited admission shelters that only do trap neuter return. They don't involve themselves in return to field. And then of course you have organizations that do both, that, that combine them. And um, then we also have uh, partnerships. We see partnerships in some communities where it's the local nonprofits that are very uh, TNR focused that partner with the municipality or the open admission shelter to perform uh, and, and provide uh, TNR services. So today um, we have Sarah Hollers, who is um, the Community Cat Program Manager for um, Animal Care Centers of New York City. So uh, technically that's a private nonprofit, but in reality it's, it's a um, more of a municipal agency because the vast majority of its funding comes from, from New York City. So we're dealing with an open admission, really municipal shelter. Um, we have Angeline uh, Fahey with the Humane Society of Southern Arizona, and her program is, uh, her organization is, is a private nonprofit. Um, so they're more, I believe, limited admission. And then uh, Jane Sage with Street Cat Hub, she, and, and Angeline is in Tucson. Uh, Jane is in Albuquerque. And she um, is part of a, of a nonprofit that has a contract with the city of Albuquerque and I think with other municipalities in, in Bernalillo uh, County uh, to provide the different services. So we have um, quite a variety of uh, people and, and programs. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, I, um, you tell me, Stacy, is it uh, um, Sarah who's going next? So, um, as Brian mentioned, we're the New York City Animal Care Centers, um, which is an open admissions shelter that serves the five boroughs. Um, we have still locations in Staten Island, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. And our, our new Queens location that we're really excited about is going to open up in March. Um, in just to give you guys an idea of what our intakes are like on a, an unusual year, um, in 2021, we took in a total of 8,853 cats and a total of 5,140 dogs. We also take in guinea pigs, rabbits, um, other exotics, whatever people bring us, we have to take it. There are several departments within the shelter. There's admissions, client care, field, animal care, who does the basic like walking dogs, cleaning kennels, vet services, and placement, which is the department we work under. The placement department covers adoptions, foster, and New Hope, which is the community where the community cat department falls under. Now, New Hope is a department that works with specifically with rescue groups to find a placement for our population when appropriate. So they're gonna reach out to these groups that are pre-approved and screened and find out who can take what based on our population. The community cat department deals with many aspects in respect to community cats. Um, it's a pretty wide spectrum. The department was originally developed based on Dr. Hurley's ideas of reducing a shelter population by having cats brought in from the community, returned to said communities, fixed, vaccinated, and ear-tipped. We also microchip our cats. 
after being evaluated for health and situational appropriateness. The objective being to reduce the population of cats by the number of cats who never should have been in the shelter system to begin with and reallocating re limited resources to animals who have no other options, thus improving shelter outcomes. To make this happen, we worked with New Hope Partners to facilitate the valuation and return of cats. Now, I want to be very clear. Um, throughout this process, we focused on health and not behavior. And I know that that's um, a controversial subject, but we focus on health and situation, not behavior. One of my favorite sayings is, not every cat in a home is nice, and not every nice cat wants a home. And we've had several situations where people have brought us nice cats only to find out that their, their neighbor's indoor-outdoor cats. Our, our feline behavior specialist in the shelter even has an indoor-outdoor cat that knows the whole community. And so we really focus on health and, and situation. This process was going okay, but there was still a lot of resistance from the finders and caretakers. We would talk to them during the intake about how the cat would possibly be returned to the community, but I don't think they actually absorbed this information and they were still pretty shocked and upset when they saw a cat in the neighborhood again. Um, because of this, because it's not fun to get those calls on a daily basis, weekly basis, we started front loading the conversations with clients, explaining, the com explaining community cats, explaining how this includes indoor outdoor cats, letting them know that health was a deciding factor, not behavior, letting them know we our policies, like giving clear boundaries for ourselves that we do not assist nor support the removal of healthy cats from the community. And then in the end, this is like the real key to the program is offering them free spay neuter services at our facility with the agreement that this cat's going to be returning and they're gonna be monitoring and letting us know if anything changes. They're gonna, they sign a contract when they do this. It's pretty, um, it's, it's, it's been working great for us. Um, this this gives both parties in this conversation what they want. The finder caretaker is not going to be asked to take that cat home that day, which is they didn't want to, they would they don't want to. Um, and then we have a placement for this cat upon intake. We know the pathway. We're not going to be using resources trying to find a place for this cat. Um, so it's a win-win. Along with this, we began funneling outdoor cat calls away from client care and dispatch and admissions to the community cat department. Now, mind you, this is at the time it was just me. So it's like 30, 40 calls a day, several emails, um, which sounds overwhelming, but we developed a cheat sheet that has all the basic questions that need to be asked based on the situation and canned responses so that we're re responding to people in a timely manner, we're catching cats we're catch we're stopping intakes before the cat even comes to the shelter resolving issues before the person comes to the shelter and a pro uh, responding to people in a consistent manner which wasn't happening before throughout this dialogue we've received really positive feedback these are some of the thank you notes from clients um, who did snr we call it snr which um shelter neuter return is what snr is supposed to stand for but a lot of our our clients and coworkers call it spay neuter return. Um, we've had such positive feedback because the client knows from the beginning this cat is going to be returning. There's no ambiguity about it. They know what's expected of them and they understand why the cat's returning because it doesn't belong in the shelter and it's not helping the other cats that are already in the shelter find placement. Um, and, and then these people do care about animals. And so when we we get to talk to them about it, and they start understanding they do care about the other cats beyond just this single cat. Um, we still work with New Hope Partners, but now it's in a more advanced way. Um, we're using our New Hope Partners and our rescue groups to really find fosters, to find long-term placements, to find difficult placements for these cats. Um, and we're able to do more advanced medical care for the cat community cats we meet now. Um, this is one example. Lily was brought into our care centers because her, by her caretaker who was requesting, caretaker requested euthanasia, which is something we provide um, free of service for caretakers when a community cat is not doing well. 
and won't do well in a home, um, we do help them to pass over. Um, but Lily was brought in and our, because we had the capacity, we ran x-rays and we found out that she had mummified fetuses in her, in her, in her. Um, we were able to do emergency surgery and after a short stint in foster, she was able to return to her caretaker who gives us regular updates on how she won't let her touch. Nobody can touch her, but she's very happy. Another example is white paws. Um, he came to us with a very bad infection in his leg that his caretaker had tried to care for, but it actually became necrotic. Uh, so we had to amputate the leg. We do, um, when there's a caretaker involved, based on the situation, we do amputate legs and tails and still allow them to return to the community. Um, as long as there's somebody keeping an eye on them, we feel like if that cat's happier outside, it was already walking around on three legs anyway. We'll just reduce the pain and allow it to continue its life. Um, White Paws is really thriving since he's returned and he always has the option to move inside should he decide to, but it's his choice in the end, which I think is really important. Beyond community cats, we also do working cat placements, which I'm very proud of. These are mainly cats that come from large cat cases. Sometimes people call these hoarding cases. Um, cats that don't necessarily want to live around humans, but cannot go outside because they've never lived outside, which is another reason why behavior is not a defining feature with our program, because feral cats do live inside. And if we decide um, a cat's placement based on its behavior, we could be putting that cat at in a very dangerous situation that would not allow them to thrive. Um, one of our best relationships that, that we've developed during this process is with a group called Hard Hat Cats that spear, that's headed by Sheila Massey, who's one of the presenters this weekend. Um, this group has gone above and beyond to find appropriate placement for cats. They go to businesses and talk to the employers there and find out where these cats could, could do their jobs. They've found... Um, jobs for cats at distilleries. One of the cats even has a beer named after it. It's Queen Elizabeth II, I think, um, but Queen Elizabeth is a he. Um, other places that they found um, jobs for cats at were hotels. Um, we have a cat that's in a Buddhist temple um, and lots of building supers throughout Bronx and New York have sidekicks that are working cats that go along with them. And they just send the most amazing photos to us of how much they love these cats who were really quite fearful in the shelter and weren't thriving and we weren't able to find placement for them any other way. This year, we also started um, doing, with a grant we received, we started doing very targeted TNR. We are basing these T, this TNR off of mortality rates in the shelter. So, um, and we decided to really focus on kitten mortality rates. So we went through our intakes, found out where the highest mortality rates of kittens were, and we're targeting those areas to try to reduce the preventable deaths that are coming to the shelter and in the community. This coupled with our SNR program, um, we for so for our SNR, another aspect of it is if somebody comes to the shelter with a kitten, our staff is trained to ask where mom is and really push that person to bring mom to us so we can provide free spay neuter. This means teaching people how to trap, loaning out equipment, um, and really walking them through the process. We don't require people to be TNR certified to work with us. In fact, we we're fine without them even knowing very much. Um, we've had clients catch cats in carriers more times than I can even mention. And just by putting food in a carrier, some of the most feral cats will just go in and they'll close it. And I'm shocked that they can get it without a trap. Um, but all of this has really reduced our kitten intakes. We used to have these frequent flyers that would bring us litter after litter each kitten season. And I don't even see those people anymore because we fixed all of the, the moms that were producing these kittens. Um, and their life is better because no care, no caretaker wants to bring kittens to a shelter. No caretaker wants to see those kittens die outside. And so I'm just really excited about our program and what we've been able to do with very limited staff. And I just am excited to see what we can do in the future. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so I think we have we have Jane, uh, Jane Sage from Street Cat Hub is up uh, next. Okay. 
So I'm Jane Sage with Street Cat Hub. I'm the founder of the organization and I'm currently board president and the volunteer trapper. I've served as executive director in the past and as the community cat coordinator. So the Albuquerque Return to Field program has been unique in that we have always had a nonprofit organization administer our return to field program. And that is also partnered with a TNR program. <clears throat> As Brian talked about earlier, in 2012, Best Friends and PetSmart Charities partnered with our city shelter uh, for a three-year program to do uh, return to field and a, and a targeted TNR program. And that was a, a very successful program. It was funded by PetSmart Charities and Best Friends. And <clears throat> the agreement was that Albuquerque would take over on that um, funding after 2015 when they left. So in 2015, I founded Street Cat Hub, and that's when we took over the return to field and the TNR. It was a, actually a contract that the city put up for bid. Um, we've been the sole bidder every time that has gone up for bid. It usually goes up in three-year increments. Um, the county has followed suit with a sole bidder, um, and, and they haven't had to put it up for bid, and it's probably the route it will continue to take. In 2020, we went through some pretty major changes, um, just kind of going from a grassroots, very grassroots neighborhood, uh, small, small facility to um, went through some major growing pains and, and ended up with a storefront and some major changes in the number of people we had to hire. Um, but it was all really in the name of sustainability. You know, we were operating at a grassroots level. We were, you know, a couple of people and volunteers that were working way too many hours. So we really redirected our energies to, to get the program set up to where it was it, it could last and, and endure these, these contracts growing and changing. So our mission in, is to serve Albuquerque and the surrounding areas with a spay and neuter of free roaming cats. <clears throat> um, our primary clients are Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Um, we, the, New Mexico gets very rural uh, very quickly once you get outside of Bernalillo County. So there's very few services for people for the cats out there. So we do try to provide services, some low cost spay neuter, um, but we're not really in a position to get contracts. We've got a couple small township contracts, but Albuquerque is our big contract. Um, they were contracted with both the return to field and the targeted TNR. Bernalillo County, we do a TNR, but the animal control officers do the return to field. So this is our storefront that we took over in 2020. Uh, we've got a lobby where people can come in, bring cats, pick up traps, and do trap classes. This is our center room where we stage all of the cats for the trap neuter return program. This is also where we recover all the cats from surgery. And this is our clinic in the back room. Prior to a couple years ago when our clinic opened, we were transporting all of the cats to various shelter, various clinics to get the spay and neuter done. Um, that's fortunately we've got our own clinic now and it's a, it's pretty necessary because a lot of those other clinics haven't gotten back up to full pace after COVID. So this is a lot better for the cats to not have to be transported and uh, a lot better for our stability and knowing exactly what we can what we can do. And we've got a couple of vans that are used for us to go out and trap with and to do the return to field. So this is our layout of uh, the people that we have in our organization now. The, the veterinarian and the vet tech over on the right are, are the new, new part of our organization in the last couple of years. And the rest of the layout really is what two people used to do has turned into what six people. Now there's three full-time positions and three part-time positions. And um, we always feel like we can use more. We're, doing about 120 cats a week uh, through our clinic. And when once we opened that clinic, that executive director position just got to be huge. So um, it, managing a clinic and managing the, the community cat part of this is a, is a huge responsibility. So, so we've needed all of these people. <clears throat> so Street Cat Hub does a comprehensive approach to TNR. It's a three-prong approach. It's the return to field, which uh, is the cats that we pick up from the shelter. We have the citizen trappers, which do the colony level trapping. And then we have the street cat hub trappers going out and doing the community level tra targeting. 
And the best way to describe this would be like kind of from the perspective of, of a mobile home park where, you know, the city shelter might get, you know, cats from five different addresses in a mobile home park. And those cats get fixed. We go pick them up. We return them to those addresses. Those get mapped on our map as a potential area that needs it needs uh, some additional work. We also are getting um, uh, calls from citizens. The city refers people to us, so they're calling and, and reporting uh, free roaming cats. Uh, lots of times it's a caretaker, sometimes it's a complaint, but we get all of those mapped out. So we might have a citizen that calls in and wants to do their own trapping. So they might come in, get traps from us, make some appointments and trap the five cats that they're feeding. So then we've got throughout the mobile home park, we've got you know five individual cats that are fixed throughout the park. And then we've got one little colony that's been fixed. And then what the street cat hub trappers are doing is going in and piecing that all together. We'll go in and, and usually we're just doing the whole mobile park all at one time. It might be a one week project. It might be a two week project, depending on the park. <laughs> but um, we're, we're using all the information that we've gathered about it so so we've got um, you know all the reports we've had of cats there we've got we're going to canvas we're going to try to find feeders and we've also got a map that we can overlay of all of our previous trapping that we've done so we can contact all of our previous feeders see if they have new cats and make sure they're withholding food while we're trapping but we're going to take that on as a whole area so just a little bit more on what the community cat coordinator is doing in the building. Um, the citizens, when they contact us, they have the option of, you know, if they can get the cat in a carrier or they can just make, a, make an appointment and bring the cat in for surgery. Um, if they've got their own trap, they can just make an appointment, bring the cat in their trap. If they know how to use the traps already, they can borrow traps from us, make the appointments. Or if they're starting at square one and need a trap class, and we offer trap classes every Tuesday afternoon. The return to field is pretty similar to other shelters. <clears throat> um, they, you know, they, they fill out people, the citizens will bring a cat in, um, they'll fill out a form. Um, we've, been, we've played a part in what, what questions are being asked as far as are there other cats, are they being fed, where was the cat found exactly. So the shelter, um, the shelter workers will, will make the decision as to whether it's going to go up for adoption or if it's an owner surrender, it'll automatically go into a different program. Um, and then the other ones will get routed to uh, to their clinic to get fixed. So this this diagram illustrates the the communication that takes place between um, the city shelter and the and, and our nonprofit. So on, in the blue we've got the um, this, it's an open admission shelter. Um, the kennel supervisors are making most of the decisions about what cats are going to go into the return to field program. But sometimes the transfer coordinator might get involved. If there's a medical issue, veterinarians might get involved and the cat behaviorist sometimes gets involved. And then anybody, anybody with Street Cat Hub that has anything to do with the return to field cats will be in the email. And these are going back and forth on a daily basis. So they're kind of communicating with us about who's coming down the pike. Um, they might have a question for us about <laughs> If they've had a cat that's been in the shelter for 45 days and it's deteriorating, they might ask us, hey, what do you think about returning this cat? What's the situation like? Do you have a colony there? That type of thing. You know, we'll, we'll give our feedback on that. And then we might give some feedback from our end. It's like, hey, I see Buddy's been in the shelter for a couple of weeks. Uh, we know he's from a colony. If he's not doing well, it'd be probably best to just tip his ear and send him our way. And then they might go back and reevaluate and make that decision based on our information. But there's a lot of different types of communication that are taking place in, our, in between us and them. But it's a, it's a pretty, really a good relationship um, that we have with our city shelter. And I think it really amounts to just, you know, on our end and their end, it's a whole bunch of people just trying to find the best outcome for each cat. And, and it's taken pretty seriously. Okay, thank you so much, Jane. Um, we're going to switch over to Angeline. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Angeline Fahey. I'm from the Humane Society of Southern Arizona's Community Cat Program, and I'm their Community Cat Programs Manager. Uh, we first start, our program was first initiated in um, 2020, at the very end of 2020, and we've made a lot of progress since then. So I'm excited to share about what we've been up to. 
So we, uh, the, so our program is based out of a private nonprofit, the Humane Society of Southern Arizona. So we're not an open admission shelter. Um, so what we focus in our program is the transmuter return aspect for our community cats here. We are located in Tucson, Arizona, but we do trap in kind of all of Pima County on the ancestral lands, uh, homelands of the Tana Aram Nation and the Pascoyaki tribe. We started off with only two staff. We were both full-time trappers, um, really wearing ourselves out, nonstop trapping. There was no structure when we first started, so we were taking phone calls and going out in the field, trying to catch as many as we could. Um, I became manager in the summer of 2021, and since then we've been able to kind of put more structure into our program and gain more staff. Um, so we just recently hired our fourth staff member. So we are a team of four. Um, it's very exciting. So I'm the manager and I have three support staff, uh, MP Barra, Pablo Gamas, and Summer Hansen. Um, and part of our team, we do have two native Spanish speakers, which is incredibly important for us because we are only 60 miles from the border of Mexico and a lot of the people in our community do speak only Spanish. Um, and then in 2022, we were able to TNR um, 2,380 cats, which was really exciting for our group. Um, and we did admit uh, a little over 300 cats to local shelters and rescues. And we do prioritize our intakes for our program um, of intakes of sick cats, um, cats who are really in need of emergency, um, cats who live with overwhelmed caregivers who have dozens of cats. Um, so we really have to prioritize in our program the trap, neuter, return aspect. So from we do trap, neuter, return, we do it a few different ways, but what we offer is free spay, neuter, free rabies and FBRCP vaccines, dewormer, flea and tick ment, and we have a non-negotiable ear tip as part of our program. Um, we do take care of minor, minor medical as needed. So we'll do wound cleanings, we give antibiotics, um, we work with another clinic um, for other types of medical needs like tail amputations, leg amputations, um, eye removal, things of that sort. Um, and then we do provide full service and trapping with assistance, which is super important for us. Um, we coordinate a lot of group trapping uh, in town, so we have group trapping one to three times a week, and we really focus on educating the public, our colony caregivers, landlords, um, and then working to educate individual independent trappers so that they can go out and do the trapping on their own as well. And I also manage our Southern Arizona Community Cat Coalition, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so we actually coordinate TNR for whoever we can. So even though we're located in Tucson, we do outreach for Cochise County, um, jurisdictions of Mariana, um, where we allow, we, we provide free TNR no matter where you're from. You just have to bring the cats to us. So we can loan traps to you, we can work with you and work surgery dates. Um, and we're just trying to empower anyone who wants to trap to do it um, and do it safely. We work with a lot of different groups um, in Southern Arizona, including like the Cochise County Humane Society, Happy Tails TNR, Southern Arizona Cat Rescue, um, and Poet Square TNR. So many of you may know her from social media. So it's been great to have these connections and be able to provide more care for the cats in our community by having these partnerships and these connections. Um, when, when we, as our program, if our shelter is overwhelmed and we're not able to take in some of the community cats that do really need intake, we're able to partner with some of our other rescues in town to get those cats the care that they need, which is super great. The first thing we do is we provide full service trap neuter return for people. Um, we are, from what I understand, we are the only organization in Pima County and actually Southern Arizona that has staff, paid staff to do all of the trapping and transportation for people. And this is really important in our community because a lot of our community members struggle with disabilities um, and they're not physically able to trap on their own. The people who can trap on their own, we encourage them to do it with us um, and be a part of the solution, but there's definitely going to be people who need that assistance or they get overwhelmed with the amount of animals in their care. So we're happy to step in and kind of help help with the process of it so it's not so overwhelming. Um, right now, we do have a wait list for that service because of how in demand our program is, um, but we do have to prioritize our sick and injured cats, cats at risk, and cats in extremely large colonies of over 20. Um, sometimes our colonies can range from 20 cats 
40 cats, um, 65 cats. Uh, so it can, it, we'll have to prioritize the one with the 65 cats. Um, we do have one staff, full-time staffer. Um, her, their name is MP Barra, and they work our evenings, and they're our evening trapper. Um, at first, we had our trappers work kind of double shifts during the day where they would work half the shift at night trapping. And then if they needed to leave traps overnight, which it's, we can here in, in Tucson because of our weather, um, if we leave them overnight, that same staff would pick them up in the morning. But that is a change that we made um, in the last year where we now dedicate another staff member or another volunteer to do those morning pickups because it's extremely tiring and we were seeing a lot of burnout with having to kind of work the full day and get a break in the middle. Um, so our full service trapping uh, is, is really helpful and the community has been very, very appreciative of it. But what we also do, uh, next slide, is we provide trapping with assistance. So this is our, this is really what we try to push with people um, where we go out to them, we bring them the traps, we educate them on trapping safely. We make sure that we answer all of their questions, um, any of their concerns. We even show them where to put the traps and the best ways to trap the cats, the timing, all of it. Um, we wanna make sure people are comfortable and that they're doing it safely. Because in Tucson, um, well, it doesn't get, it gets cold, but our, our, biggest, our biggest danger is our, our weather in the, the summer. We, it gets extremely hot, um, 115, 120 degrees, and cats cannot be left in those traps for a long period of time. So educating people that yes, trapping can kill a cat is really, really important for us and making sure people are thinking of the cat's safety and that they have a plan when they're trapping. So um, we do provide transportation for people who are able to trap on their own. Um, and we also have trappy volunteer trappers. So uh, if we have emergencies that need, if we have emergencies or rescues, we can call on our volunteers um, and they can actually help us with these, with these emergencies. Um, we train volunteers in the hope that they'll be able to lead their own groups and it's, it's working. Um, after a year and a half of kind of doing this volunteer group, we're starting to see volunteers um, spreading off and, and trapping on their own, creating their own volunteer groups. Um, so it's been really great because um, what we've learned is that we cannot we cannot take care of the cat population in this town on our own. We need as many people as possible to do the trapping with us. Um, in Tucson, the biggest challenge is our population. We have a lot of a lot of outdoor cats in this town. We have a lot of good um, shelter for them in mobile home parks. We have a lot of rodents and wildlife for them to eat. Um, so that's that's our biggest concern. So in, in, we have a lot of uh, euthanasia also in certain counties. So not Pima County, but surrounding counties have really high kill rates of of unadoptable cats. Um, so what we're trying to do is empower anyone we can to kind of be a part of the solution and learn and be educated. Um, and we also have specific volunteers dedicated to certain parts of town. So if we have uh, certain trap sites, we'll, we'll make sure to provide like our Catalina trapper, all of our Catalina sites and kind of having them separated like that really helps as well. Uh, we have our trap loan program where we're educating and encouraging the public to be a part of our solution. Uh, we ask them to make an appointment with us at the Humane Society where they come down to our clinic and we sit with them for it's about half an hour to an hour, depending on the person. And we talk about everything that they need to know. We do have them sign agreements and paperwork stating that they are only using the traps for trap neuter return or to provide medical care for community cats. Um, we don't provide a we don't ask for a deposit on our equipment because we want our services to be available for everyone. Um, the poverty rate in Tucson is actually 62% higher than the U.S. average. So we're we're working with a lot of people who do not have the the resources needed to do TNR. A lot of our clients don't have like transportation. They don't even have medical care for themselves. Um, so we don't want the deposit to be a factor in why they wouldn't be able to provide this care for the cats. Um, we provide all of the materials that they need and we do check-ins. So after a couple of weeks, we'll call them and see how it's going, provide, us, um, provide some tips, um, see if they need our help. Um, we also do trap loans for lost cats and escaped cats and sometimes we're able to reunite cats with their owners. And we do have one staff that's kind of dedicated to that trap loan aspect, to that trap loan program and helps us with phone calls and data entry. 
Something that we created at the same time as our community cat program is our Southern Arizona Community Cat Coalition. And we are a group of cat trappers, rescuers, advocates, and colony caregivers from all, of the, all over Southern Arizona and from all different groups. So we have people from different rescues, um, the county shelters, so different people um, are a part of this group. And we meet every month to discuss ways we can improve our community and for community cats and how we can improve TNR or maybe a caregiver has certain questions, legal questions, so we're always there to provide support. Um, our group has been especially great at trapping, so we go out to certain neighborhoods and we will canvas as a group and locate feeders. Um, and locate properties where we can set our traps on. We go out as a group often because where we're trapping in Tucson is actually pretty dangerous. We do run into a lot of dangers outside. It gets um, in the nighttime. Um, most of the places we're, tra we're trapping at are lower income areas. Um, so we've been, like we've had volunteers who've had guns pulled on, pulled on them and things like that. So we have to be extremely careful um, when we're out there. So trapping in a group helps us with safety, where there's more of us, we keep track of each other, we use the buddy system, and we also wear uh, these bright purple vests. So, and we wear cat ears, we try to make ourselves as friendly looking as possible. Um, so people don't think we're there to like take away their cats or hurt their cats or anything like that. We're just there to help. Um, we have our Facebook group uh, that people are on and that we can exchange, you know, stories and ask for help. Um, we have a contact exchange for emergencies, so if it's on the weekend and staff is not working, um, they have people that they can call and contact and get help from. Uh, we also use safety whistles, and we have customizable business cards for each of our trappers, and it just really provides a space of community support and safety. Um, most of our trappers who want to help us want to come out in these group, group meetings, because it's hard to find other people who are doing the same thing you're doing um, and really are passionate about trapping the cats. So um, this group has been really great. And if you're in Southern Arizona, please join our group. The big thing we do is we love to educate. Um, some of the problems in Southern Arizona, like people don't appreciate community cats. It's, uh, it's often because of wildlife concerns, nuisance complaints. Um, we get a lot of property managers unhappy about the amount of cats in their mobile home parks or at the apartment complex. So we often just educate. We talk to people all day long on the phone um, about what we're doing. Uh, we do cold calls and we'll call businesses and ask if they're having issues and if we can help them. Um, the biggest thing for us is we can't force anyone to work with us. So we really try to approach each situation with compassion and kindness and friendliness. Because um, if they close that door on our face, then we, we're not helping anyone, not the community and not the cats. Um, we do biweekly newsletters and we have TNR updates in our community, uh, webinars that people can learn from. We do a lot of presentations, um, university adult education, HOA, neighborhood associations. Um, I was grateful to be on the Community Cat podcast. And we do talk with birding groups because it's important. Uh, I think someone mentioned it earlier that um, people who love wildlife are conservationists are not fans of trap neuter return. So one of our goals is to kind of break that down and, and figure out why that is and um, talk to these people who are concerned for wildlife and educate them on why TNR does help wildlife actually. So that's been really interesting to kind of to be involved in. And then we do trapping Tuesdays. So every Tuesday we invite anyone from the community to join us while we're out trapping. Um, that way we can show them what it's like to be a cat trapper, what we're facing, and kind of what the community really deals with when it comes to community cats. So we're, it's a no commitment. We have people sign a waiver. We just want them to be educated and be a part of our solution um, together. We educate caregivers uh, when we're out trapping with them. Um, a lot of the caregivers are unaware of the resources that are available or they're unaware that what they're doing could actually be contributing to the cat population. Most of the people we work with never, didn't start the issue. They just saw animals that were hungry and wanted to feed them. So we educate on proper feeding practices to not encourage wildlife. We do have quite a lot of wildlife in Arizona. Um, we provide materials as needed. We give them uh, shelters and bowls and food, flea and tick medicine, diatomaceous earth. Um, we provide uh, resources where they can get financial help, food help, medical help. Um, we hold winter cat shelter workshops 
Um, we just did one last week and made 53 cat shelters in three hours which was really hard work, but we're so excited to be able to distribute those to our colony caregivers. And we invite them to be a part of our coalition um, because we need the caregivers to be a part of PNR and a part of our community so that they, don't, they feel like they have an outlet, they have other people who support them. A lot of times when we come to caregivers and we knock on their door because we see all of the cats, they are so overwhelmed with relief to find someone or find a group of people that A, speaks their language and B, um, is just nice and it's just kind to them. Um, we deal with a lot of animal cruelty in this town and so it's, it's, it's very difficult. Something we're really proud of is that we keep track of all of our colonies on MapLine. Um, it's a paid service, um, but it really helps us out it, uh, when we keep track of where our colonies are coming from, who's taking care of them, how many cats they have, whether they need TNR or not. We keep track of areas we need to canvas more, areas that are potential dump sites of cats. And all of this data really helps us identify patterns in areas in need of TNR. Um, we can locate new feeders. Uh, if people are moving away and they're really worried about their colonies, we can see that there are feeders in their neighborhoods. We write notes for future interactions or um, so this the, keeping track of the colonies is probably one of the it, it's time consuming to keep track of that data but this has been extremely useful for us um, and it helps us to share this map with other rescues who are like also working in tnr they can kind of see what we've already worked on and where we're at um, so i highly recommend google has a really um, oops has a really good uh system as well for keeping track, but we liked MapLine because we can, um, we can personalize all the different little labels. So my role, I want to talk a little bit about my role and what I do. Uh, I developed the program and protocols for our program, um, and I communicate directly with the other departments and rescue partners. So if we have cats from a big colony, um, and some of them are friendly, and we would like to intake some into our shelter because the care caregiver is just overwhelmed with the number of cats. That would be my job to communicate that with our admissions team and kind of make those decisions with them on whether or not it's feasible. Um, I work on the budget and we purchase materials for the program and I'm currently in the process of developing our new community cat center that will hopefully open in a couple of months or we will be able to provide more programs for community cats. I do a lot of coordinating, so it's a lot of coordinating volunteers and staff group trapping. Uh, we often are trapping at multiple sites in one night to kind of to spread out um, and then coordinating our surgery availability for the week. Um, problem solving, creative solutions and making difficult decisions. That is a part of being a program manager. Um, and I'm the leader of the Southern Arizona Community Cat Coalition. And then whenever we have any education, educational talks or presentations, you bet I'm the one that's doing that. Um, but I really enjoy the education aspect of it. I do not believe we can really focus on decreasing that cat population without educating everyone in the community, um, even the cat haters. <laughs> So I'm very lucky that I work within a private nonprofit so where I don't need to be in charge of finding the funding for our surgeries and for our program. Our program was initiated by a large donation from a private donor um, who start, who just gave us big donations said, hey, do what you can in one year and we will revisit in a year and see how it's going and I'll see if I'll, I'll refund your program. So that's how I was hired and thankfully she's really happy about the way things are going. Um, so she, we have private donors like her, and then we have foundations that are contributing. Um, we do have grants at TNR on native land. Um, we have a website links for direct donations, and a lot of our TNR funds are actually supplemented by various organizations or the county. Um, so we're very lucky in our town to have free trap meter return and medical care for community cats. Um, we do our, our surgeries at our Humane Society Play Neuter Clinic. Um, we also pay a second clinic to do all of our overflow cats, and we often partner with other shelters like Pima Animal Care Center when they have the big spay neuter events. Um, coming up, there's a big 600, uh, big spay neuter event for 600 cats, and that's what we'd be participating in. We've learned a lot while doing this program, and the number one thing is that we cannot do this alone. We need the caregivers to be a part of the trapping and to understand what we're doing and to 
contact us when they have more cats that need to be trapped for stay and neuter. Um, we also need morning support staff if uh, if an evening if if someone is trapping overnight or in the evening. Um, we also learned that bilingual staff is crucial. So after uh, the two first trappers being English speaking, uh, majority English speaking, it was really difficult. So I made sure that the first the first two that the other people we hired on our team that we had at least one person that could speak Spanish and we're very lucky to have two. Um, we are we are no judgment trapping. So when we go out, we are compassionately trapping. We are not um, reprimanding or shaming people for not having done the trapping already or um, we oftentimes come across caregivers with cats who are in extreme need of medical care. So in that instance, we try to educate, try to be um, try to be compassionate and provide them the resources that they need. We've learned that you really need to have city programs, social workers, adult protective services, and animal protective service, animal cruelty investigators. All of those phone numbers need to be close at hand because um, we do contact other programs when needed. Um, and the biggest thing really is to take care of yourself and your team to avoid compassion fatigue and burnout. Because a lot of the stuff we see in the field is it's pretty terrible and it can follow you. Um, we see cats in extremely awful condition um, that the caregivers who simply are either not quite aware or they're just they just don't care. Um, so be, having a team that is really compassionate is not going to lash out at those people is very important. Because once we close those doors, once that door gets shut on us, if we're, if we're mean and they shut that door on us, we cannot help those cats and we can't help that person. Um, so that's something that our team has been really working on and, and we find it's extremely important. We do have a lot of future plans. Um, we are gonna continue building our community of cat trappers and partners. Um, but we have our community cat center that is opening this year where we're going to be able to provide more programs for community cats. Um, it's hopefully going to be a state of the art center where we're going to provide medical assistance and recovery space for cats before they're returned to field to their caregivers. Um, a kitten kindergarten to get the, some of the feral kittens um, socialized before we can place them up for adoption. Uh, we hope to have a working cat program so we can place our vulnerable cats who are not adoptable into a working cat or a barn cat situation um, where they have a caregiver, but they wouldn't have to be euthanized due to their behavior. Um, we plan to do a lot more education classes and classes for our caregivers themselves, how to take care of community cats um, and, and things like that. And of course, our colony food assistance. It's a big problem here in Tucson is lack of pet food um, and lack of assistance for colony cats. So we're excited to be able to, to spearhead a project for that too. And moving down into Southern Arizona, we've just started to, um, to coordinate trappers in Douglas. Um, we're, we're opening a monthly spay neuter clinic in Douglas with the help of the Cochise College Vet Tech program. And we're gonna start a program down there as well. So it's very exciting and we're hoping to have a program in every county in Southern Arizona eventually. Um, so if you'd like to contact me with any questions or just want to talk or you have, you know, please do. Um, here's my contact information and please join our Facebook groups as well. Um, and that's all I have for you. And thank you so much for listening to me. And yeah, I hope you have a great time at the conference today. I'm going to uh, let me put this out. The, the um, theme for today is we're really looking at the job and the program, uh, you know, how the programs are made up. Uh, but I want to talk today about the actual job of being in charge of a community cat um, program. And tomorrow, for those of you who've been asking about like microchipping and how do you deal with the lack of spay neuter capacity, if that's if you're facing that, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about policy um, tomorrow. But what I wanted to ask um, each of our panelists today is if you could just briefly um, tell us like. How did you how did you first get involved with community cats, and then how did that become a career? You know, for other people out there who are are um, excited by what uh, the positions that you have. So, do we want to start um, start that off, Sarah? Sure. Um, so, I I guess my bio said I was um, a professor at Hunter College for a while, and there were I I have dogs obviously that I walk every day and I kept walking by this neighbor and she just kept she talked to me about how her 
the cat she feeds was pregnant again and the kittens kept getting hit by cars and she was so upset she didn't know what to do and i thought well i can i can fix that it'll be easy and so i emailed and called and i was it was really hard it was not that easy and i finally found the neighborhood cats website and i went to this very strange tnr workshop in the middle of nowhere queens in the library and this this woman told us like regaled us with these stories of different situations trapping cats and it was i just really liked the people i was with i liked the way they talked about cats because i'm from southeastern oregon in the middle of nowhere and wildlife was a really big part of my life growing up so it was just nice to being in the city you don't always feel connected to that so it was really interesting being around people who were talking about wildlife but on a urban interface and how they were dealing with it and i did the first cat um through the ASPCA, um, it went really well. The neighbor called me 20 million times throughout the surgery to check on how she did. And um, it just was a great experience. I started catching kittens and um, socializing them. And then I found myself just like wanting to just go home and trap animals. So luckily this job came up at the same like right when i was hitting my peak the this job came up and i thought well that'd be nice to get paid to do something i'm already doing and be nice to not spend all of my money that i'm making on on doing all this stuff so i i started the job and i really cut back on what i call micro rescue and i just haven't looked back because it's just been so amazing the people i've met um i work with brian and susie a lot and just like a really wonderful community. And they these cats really do build community. They're true to their name. So I'm just, I just really am glad I found my spot. Oh, great. How about you, Jane? How did you end up in the world of uh, community cats and then decide that, I guess you, you talked about how the, the uh, program with the Albuquerque evolved into a nonprofit, I guess, in response to, they needed a contractual partner. But if you want to tell us a little more, Nope, oh, can't hear you. Okay. Are you on uh are you on mute, Jane? Yeah, I think it just unmuted. Oh, there you go. You're okay. Good. Yeah, so I got started when I moved to Albuquerque. I moved into a neighborhood that was charmingly full of cats. They like to sleep on the streets. Um, they were kind of ever present. A lot of them were neighbors' cats. Nobody was getting their cats fixed. So a lot of it were, was their cats having kittens. Um, but uh, we started to do um, contact the, the services that were available. Fortunately, Albuquerque did have a lot of TNR going on even back into the 90s. They had a group that was doing TNR. So there were some resources available. We also contacted a vet that was closest to us and uh, made an agreement with her to do them at $65 a cat. So, so we got a lot of them fixed. I think we ended up trapping about 65 cats out of out of our own yard. So, and eventually got the got the neighborhood under control and and kind of branched out from there. Um, it it really was looking at the stats in the newspaper um about the city shelter that kind of pushed me to take it to another level because we were euthanizing like i don't know it was like eight thousand cats a year in albuquerque and it was just you know it was disproportionately higher than the dogs which the dogs wasn't a good thing either but you know it just seemed like there was a lot of inequity and 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 i just you know we, we started to get attached to neighborhood cats and we started to get worried when one would go missing and you know go to the shelters and they were getting taken to the shelters we had a lot of neighbors that had historically just trapped the cats and taken them to the shelter and it wasn't exactly legal back then we had some laws in place that if you fed them you owned them and so so there wasn't much support so so i got very involved with the advocacy part of it um things started to change i think a lot of when you know hsus changed their position i think a lot of the people in animal welfare started to to look at things differently so we got different different management at the city shelter in 2010 it must have been when Jacksonville started to do some return to field. So some of the people in the shelter must have had an inkling of what was going on there. And, you know, we just had the right combination of people on the inside and the outside where we just like approached them and was like, hey, if we pick, went through these intakes and 
saw some good places for cats to go back, you know, what would you think about fixing them and tipping their ears? And we, we returned them and we actually did like 800 cats that way over a couple of years. And I think that was part of what got, you know, Best Friends and Pet Smart Charities interested was the fact that we were doing some already and we had some pretty active TNR in Albuquerque. And then um, I actually had, was retired at the time, um, but when Best, Part, Best Friends came in and they actually created that position, um, I didn't take the paid position initially, even though I was very involved with the program. But um, then when Desiree ended up, I think she went and worked for Best Friends and I did take over that paid position and continued you know, to, to make a career out of it um, you know, for, the, for the next five years. And, you know, it's, it's just, I just never, never done anything where I could have such an influence. I mean, it's like every single cat you trap, you're changing their life. You know, it's just, I've never done anything where I felt like it had so much meaning to it. So, um, you know, I just, I, I just want to trap cats until I die doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, you know, Angeline, I got to ask you, I mean, it, it sounds like a common theme among people who, are working with community cats professionally that they sort of wake up every day and I'm getting paid to do this. You know, is that is that your feeling? Um, yeah, I think it's it's a pretty unique opportunity to be paid to help cats. Um, personally, I've always been very very much in love with cats since I was little. I've always interacted with the outdoor cats in Arizona. Um, and even in uh, my fa uh, my mother's from France, so I spent a lot of my summers growing up in France, and there's a lot of outdoor cats. Um, and, and I would feed cats at my elementary school, and then, but what really, what I always remember what's so important is when I was younger and growing up in the summers in France is what they would have kittens all the time, and um, the older French countryside folk would have no other option but to kill the kittens if they couldn't find placement for them. So that has always stayed with me um, while I do this work. But I originally was just always in nonprofits. I started with helping um, kids with serious illness like cancer and other illnesses with art therapy programs, and then moved to wildlife education where I worked with, for the only wildlife hospital in Tucson. Um, and I did their, I pro, uh, developed their education program and rehabbed small birds and mammals. But when this opportunity to trap community cats appeared on my Indeed, uh, um, Indeed, I was very stunned and went, wow, this sounds like the perfect opportunity for me. Um, from adopting community cats to at that time when I had seen that application, I was taking care of my own community cats. So it just kind of was really a fit. And even though the job is extremely difficult and there are days where I just, just it's just so hard and I don't know how to make the decisions that we're making and do all the work we're doing and all the abuse we get over the phone. Um, it really is worth it to be able to make a difference and not just the cats, but the community and the people who are caring for them, seeing the relief and the, 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 the joy on their face when they meet people who care about them and their cats and are willing to help them. That's, that's I think, is my driving force is to help the people who, who don't have community to help them. And, you know, I, I think one of the things, uh, since this is such a relatively new field, um, that e either uh, you might be working alone or you might have a limited number, even if you have staff people, uh, you know, it's, it, there's no question, I, I, I think I can speak for everybody, that the amount of um, work, the amount the demand from the public for community cat services uh, it's going to far outstrips the resources that that you have. Um, I mean, it's a kind of a you know, community cats are often when you look at the sheer number of animals involved are, are going to be the largest animal welfare issue in most communities. And uh, so, Sarah, I know when you started, you were one person for the entire New York City municipal animal shelter. So how did, how did you cope with that and how did you get help and how do you deal with it even with help? Um, so I, it was, I first developed like this cheat sheet that has all of, we do a stray cat history when any cat comes in from outside. It's to replace the cat interview where an owner would give you information about a cat. So how did you pick this cat up? What was the exact address? 
Um, how long had you seen it before you brought it in? Are there any health conditions? And just all these questions. So we developed that, which has all these automatic answers you can give in the email, really started working to direct everything towards email and text messages. So it can I can be on the phone and I can be texting somebody at the same time. And then just indoctrinating other staff members, like being nice to people, which is what you should already be doing, but really like talking to people about what my department is. A lot of people when I first started, even though the ACC, um, that's the acronym we go by, had had a community cat department for years before I came there. Many of the other departments didn't know what they did. They thought like they would, there'd be these arguments about how nice a cat was, it shouldn't go back out or that we shouldn't be doing it at all. And the more I started talking to staff, um, really just ingratiating myself to them, being nice to them, talking about what they do, the more they became interested in what I do um, and they started reaching out to me about cats they would see in their own community. What do I do? And just really training everyone to respond appropriately to cats. And the more I did that, the easier my job came, became because I'm not doing everything anymore. Everybody else is kind of contributing to our department, even though it's a department of only two. Admissions talks to people about community cats. Field talks to people about community cats client care every and vet services even like well now they before we were having arguments with vet services about cats going back out now i'm getting emails from our vet services team where they're nominating cats because they've read the record they think this cat should go back out can you take a look so just really building the team around you and and involving other departments and and letting people talk to you about cats why they think something and then just talking to them about why you think something it really it works it takes a while it took three years to get to this place from when i started but it's in a much better place than when i started and it's much easier because of it so it's it sounds like it's especially when you're the first one in the door or, or one of the newest which you probably everybody is in this kind of a position there's, it, it's not just working with the public, it's not just um, the community, but you actually have to work within your own organization too, to build that kind of understanding. And, um, you know, uh, let me jump to Angeline because you're working within, um, I'll get, I'll, I'll ask you, Jane, you have a different perspective, but Angeline, do, do you find that mm -hmm. within um, your organization yeah. that you're, you're also advocating with staff? Oh, 100%. Um... It's really difficult because when I don't think they thought thought it through when we started trap unit return program, you absolutely will have cats that need medical care or need placement in the shelter. And so that was kind of forgotten when the program first started. So it's been a challenge to intake cats at our shelter um, just because we already have such a high demand and we're already intaking for several counties. Um, so kind of finding the space within our shelter for community cats that deserve to be placed into a home or they need the medical care, um, that has been our challenge. And yeah, just, just having our staff understand the importance and the hardships of what we go through. Um, it's not quite so easy as just going out with traps and having a good time and picking up cats and bringing them back. Um, so it has been, our, our shelter has been way more open to, to us and understanding what we're going through, which has been it's been challenging, but I, it, it just take a little bit of time to kind of change the way people think about, I guess, community cats, even within staff. How about how about you, Jane? Because you're you're working as a non outside nonprofit, but does that make it easier or harder when you're dealing with shelter staff that you're not part of the shelter? I think it kind of varies it. We for the most part our relationship with the shelter has been really good we, we went through one one little quirk you know where the, the shelter had considered bringing the program within the shelter and we were kind of looking at we were going to be discontinued and at that point i was I mean, we were doing that was when we, we were really grassroots and we had a couple people doing a lot and you know we're all really overworked we were doing medical we were doing adoptions we were trying to just do everything and um at that point i, I actually took a took a step away and we had a a, a person um, here from that came in from seattle she had moved here 
Anna Ludwig who took over and she really revamped the whole program. And I, I just, I wouldn't have had the energy to do it, but um, the shelter did decide to keep the contract with us. And that's where we changed storefronts. We changed, you know, the, the staffing was, was increased drastically. And it, it just really, it was all in the name of sustainability, but the relationship with the shelter after that again is, is pretty incredible. I think anybody who I've worked with throughout the years is, you know, just loves this program. I mean, the, the people that, there's not very many people at the shelter that were there in 2012 when, when Best Friends first came in. Um, there's a handful of people and, and they, they know that this program transformed that whole shelter because, you know, once the cat program improved, the dog situation improved, you know, and they're, they're working really hard to maintain a no-kill status. I don't know we're quite doing that right now, but with the cats, we probably are uh, with, due to this program. But, um, but our relationship with the shelter right now is, is pretty fantastic. I just feel like they're very respectful of our opinions. Um, you know, if we're, we go to return a cat, it's just, doesn't feel right like this cat just doesn't have a clue where it is it's super tame it's like won't get off my lap it's you know climbing back into the van you know lots of times we'll just shoot video of it and get some you know shoot it back to them the behaviorists will look at it and it's just like I think it'd be good to reconsider because this cat doesn't know where it is you know maybe it was newly abandoned or we got a bad address or something and I never get anything but respect from the city shelter workers you know regarding our our options to to not return a cat and you know, and, and just the fact that they ask us questions, you know, like we might get a veterinarian from the city shelter asking us, you know, like we got a front cat that needs a front leg amputation. Do you think it's, you know, an okay place to put the cat back, you know, and, you know, and we'll kind of evaluate it, make sure, you know, because it's a pretty drastic, you know, measure to take a front leg off. And, you know, so so that that communication is, is, is really good. I, our relationship with the shelter is, is pretty, is great. <laughs> That's great. And, you know, Sarah, I can speak from personal experience that you also work with uh, local nonprofits, right, to help figure out what to do. And, and, and that is another way, I guess, of extending your reach and, and your resources. So can you talk a little bit about how you, and you can mention Neighborhood Cats if you want to, so, <laughs> it's okay, but how you work, you know, how you kind of um, stretch your limits by incorporating um, nonprofits in the community. Yeah, so I think like being part of the New Hope Department, that is like the nonprofits that we work with, and I say rescue groups, but that also carries to nonprofits. They're the whole reason why we have this program. They're the reason why it started. Neighborhood Cats and Dr. Hurley are the reason why we started this program and why it's continued. Um, just having people like I will reach out specifically to you and Susie. Like I don't know about this cat and. What do you guys think? And sometimes I, it's just really nice to have somebody else as a sounding board. So it's not just me making the decisions about these cats. And I don't know every neighborhood off the top of my head. Staten Island has so many different parts to it. The Bronx, um, Queens, like I go to all of the shelters on a weekly basis, but having a connection to trappers that are in that area um, we started sending, we had always send out, sent out ear tip alerts, but now they go through the ASPCA. So anybody who's TNR certified will get an ear tip alert about a cat that comes into the shelter. Um, so we're really mobilizing the whole community around these cats and how to protect them and how to keep them safe and how to get them back or to remove them from the community. Cause there are a lot of cats that aren't thriving out there. Um, so that's how I, th I think we couldn't exist without nonprofits, honestly. So, so Angeline, it's, it's do, what relationship do you have with um, the municipal shelter in, in your area? And I think that's Pima County Animal Control. And if, yeah, if I, if it's I Pima Animal. Correct, they have a return to field program, right? Do you interact? How do you, how do you interact with them? How does your program? They do. Yeah, they have their own community cat program as well. We kind of operate differently. Um, where they uh, they provide mostly trap drop-offs and transportation for the community, and then we kind of do the physical trapping. So we do work together, um, and we may share trap sites. Um, sorry, I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> um, so we do share trap sites, uh, and we talk about our clients. Like, they are on our list, so when I send out a list to our group about where we're going to be and where we're trapping, they can respond and be like, oh, that person was on my schedule too. So, hey, like I'll take them off and you can take care of them. So we do 
talk about our, our trap sites and work together and we'll share different sites depending on who like just which one is able to get to them sooner or be able to help them the most. Um, and so we're, we're, we keep kind of improving our, our relationship and um, Team Animal Care Center also took in and was doing a lot of our TNR surgeries when we first started. Um, so we, they do support us in a lot of ways and they do have that big event every year that's about once or twice a year where they TNR 600 cats in one weekend and we're big participants of that program or that event. Well, that's great. Um I want to ask each of you a, a question that fits your, your situation. So, um, Sarah, in terms of being a community cat program manager, what do you think is the unique um, challenges of working for what is effectively a municipal agency, you know, part of the government? So one of the most difficult parts of working this way is that we work closely with the Department of Health. Um, so if a cat comes into our shelter with a wound of unknown origin, there's a very good chance that cat's going to end up on a Department of Health hold that we are required by law to report. And I find that the most challenging because the six months for a community cat to be in quarantine is not fair or right, in, in my opinion. And I, I feel like it's a horrible situation. Um, the way we have been able to address this is working again with nonprofits to find fosters for these um, for these cats if the caretaker is not able to foster and really working to get this cat in an appropriate situation out of the shelter so that it can be monitored. Um, we do the check-ins, the monthly check-ins with the person, but the groups have really like have really helped us find these fosters and and before. I think these cats would have likely been euthanized or deteriorated in the shelter or gone to inappropriate placements with groups that don't know community cats and would have tried to place them in a home. So I find that's one of the most difficult parts is the reporting and the following the rules that are in place by organizations other than ourselves. Hey, and Jane, how about you? What what are the unique challenges of being, you know, a nonprofit? you know, being a community cat program manager as a nonprofit outside the shelter system? Well, I think there's the issue of changing administrations and funding. And, you know, I think with leaning more towards managed intake, I think the, you know, I think the program, if you're going to, if you're going to do more with the cats outside of the shelter, it's always, we need more funding if we're, we're going to be able to handle those numbers so um so i guess i guess the funding is is still an issue as well funded as our program is but it's like the, the more you know I, there's all kinds of stresses being put on our sh our shelter right now with the lack of spay neuter and um you know the, the aftermath of COVID and everything so you know it just it just feels pretty over our, our wait list is just overwhelming <laughs> and you know and and it's the, the, you know, just I mean, we could rally the trappers together. We could probably get more veterinarians to come in, but it's like the the lag in getting that funding there is is probably the the biggest challenge. And and how about you, Angeline? Do you do you find um, you know working for a limited admission shelter? Are there are there unique mm -hmm. challenges that you face that are, you think are unique yeah. to that type of situation? Yeah, I believe so because we are, you know, limited on the amount of animals we can intake. So there are situations where I need intakes for a cat um, and I have to find that placement elsewhere. Um, we were able to place about 100 cats to other rescues and shelters last year through our program um, because we just didn't have the capacity to take them on. But I'd say like one of our biggest challenges is just the expectations from our community. Um, they'll call and expect us to be out on their property the very next day, trap all of the cats, do it all for free, you know, and like, and, and it just, and they can be rude to us as well. So, I mean, <laughs> our biggest challenge is kind of the public perception of what we're doing and um, just the assumption that we are, we have infinite resources and can intake all of their cats or we can intake feral cats and um, just and that we're animal control and that we have like more of a people often confuse us with the county shelter um, so they think we're animal control and have the right to like remove animals from them or give them fines um, so kind of kind of those those things <laughs> are our challenges sure um, I know a question came in 
uh, from from the um, attendees about whether there's a community cat program manager support group, and I'm I'm not aware of one. I think that might be a project for Community Cats podcast that might take on. But are are you guys aware of? Are, is there any central Facebook group or? I, I don't think so. I'm not aware of one. No. Okay. So we're, I think that may be something we have to we have to start. Mm -hmm. um, so let me be, close out with one last question for today. Again, focusing on your individual job. And tomorrow we'll talk about what do you do with friendly cats and how do you target and all the kind of policy uh, issues mm -hmm. that you guys have to deal with. But for today, let me ask each of you, what do you, what do you see as your future? Because um, you're, you're, you're kind of pioneers, you know, but when you look ahead, when you look like three years from now or five years from now, where, where do you see yourself in terms of community cats or animal welfare in general? Or is, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Let me start with you, Sarah. Or ho where do you hope to be if you don't have plants? <laughs> um, well, I hope someday that we can have a, a clinic that's next to the shelter that anybody who brings a cat in, in or inside or out can get free spay neuter. I like that would be, my, I don't see how that's going to happen, but that's, that would be my dream because the amount of requests for spay neuter and the number of people who want it is astounding. And it's really amazing that we've come this far that people are wanting this, but I, I wish we could give it for free. We shouldn't have, people shouldn't have to pay to get their, for birth control for their animals. It, it should be a given so that we can stop having the problems we have. Well, I'm going to give you give you one big plug, Sarah, because I know that um, you, you talked about intake of cats is now eight to nine thousand. Um, wasn't that long ago? It was twenty to twenty five thousand. So yeah, you're doing a great job. But what about you personally? How do you see yourself in the future? I hope I'm, I stay in this. I hope I, I can stay in animal welfare. I did make that big change from teaching to this, um, and it's only been, I think, five years. Um, but I really, really love the, the people we work with. I love the people I meet at all of these events and, and the stories they have to tell. There are some really amazing um, people that have gone through so many things and seen so many things. And I just hope I can I continue to stay here and I don't. Um, that I don't get compassion fatigue to the point where I have to leave. Um, Fair enough. How about you, Jane? Where, where do you see yourself in the future or your role? <laughs> well, I'll still be trapping. <laughs> I, I, I'm doing, it, it's what I love. It, it's, it's why I'm in the position I'm in right now. We have an incredible executive director that's managing the program. We've got an incredible clinic staff and community cat manager in the building there. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I look at it more like instead of trapping colonies of 20, 30 cats, it's going to start to dwindle down to where it's going to be doing colonies of 10 again. And <laughs> it's just it's it's going to just get get a little bit easier again. I, I hope to see Albuquerque back to where it was. Okay. And how about you, Angeline? What do you see as as a in your future as a community cat program manager? <laughs> well, I definitely want to stay in the world of animal welfare. Um, that's definitely a passion of mine, um, but I would like to see like our county have less kittens, less kittens being born, um, and to have more clinics that provide surgery on a walk-in basis and also surgery on the weekends. Because I know a lot of people would be more involved if there was surgeries availability on the weekends, um, and so that would be and also spreading TNR throughout the counties um, south of Tucson, so kind of getting into more of the cities like Nogales and um santa cruz and trying to improve the the save rate over there with tnr because their euthanasias are extremely high for outdoor cats so working more with other shelters more south of where we are and providing them resources well, it does sound like there's plenty of work to do in the future for sure no it's great you guys have oh, yeah. big plans so you know stacy i think um we can hand it over to you for to, to close out the day. This was a fantastic session. I just thank you so much. It's just what you've all shared and, and it's wonderful. And 
Brian and I have talked about a, a couple of things. Um, you know, the community cap program manager support group sounds like a great idea for sure. Um, and then also to promote the position, this position that's, you know, as I was saying to Brian, that you don't sit around the table as a teenager and say, I want to be a community cap program manager, you know, at Thanksgiving dinner or whatever, you know, so it's, maybe you know how do we have like job fairs um and you know some information about you know how to get out there and to try and recruit more people a lot of you are sector switchers right you've come from different areas and moved into a little did i know brian was an artist at one point in time in south boston or whatever <laughs> and so you've switched and 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 come into this field that probably when you were a teenager you had no idea existed so how can we get this um, position this idea, this concept out there to a greater range of people, so that there, there's more people coming into the field. Many hands makes light work. We heard that earlier today, and and that's for sure true in with here with CommuniCat's um, you know manager, CommuniCat program manager. So anyway, uh, some of the ideas we're percolating around with to try and try and help support everybody. <laughs>